Carpenters Ministry presents this refreshing and life-changing teaching. We trust that this message will be a blessing to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we lift our hands to Jesus and bless his holy name. Thank you, Father. We give you praise and we give you glory. We are who you say you, we are. We are who you say we are. We have what you say we have. We can do what you say we can do. We are where, what you say, where you say we are. We can become who you say we can become because of your promises to us and because of Jesus Christ. It's all because of Jesus. It's all because of Jesus. It's all because of Jesus. And we reverence that glorious and that majestic name. Just lift your hands to him and give him glory. For he is deserving of all the honor, the glory, the adoration, the praise. His name alone is to be praised. His name alone is praised. We give you praise, Father God, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Glory to God. Are you glad to be in church today? Amen. Why not welcome the person by your side? By your left hand, by your right hand. Ask them how their day was. What did they say? What did they say? Yeah, somebody is in the spirit. What did they say or what should they have said? Praise God. So do it again. Ask the person, how was your day? All I'm here is God is big in me. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen and amen. So today we are continuing with our study. God is big in me. And the musicians fell my hand today. If he, all right. God is big in me. This is part six. Have we been blessed with this series or what? And how many of you are fol following the concurrent series on Fresh Dew? How many of you? God is big in me. Praise the Lord. Okay, so today is part six. We started out this uh, from the beginning of this year, and we are still on section one. <laughs> you see, when you are taking a message and you call it God is big, God will show you that even that message itself is what? Is big. You can't take a message, God is big, in, in two or three or even ten parts. So just uh, full ground remain because this year, God is, big. even the study itself is big. Amen. So we started with section one and then we started with a definition. The word big means by now, I'm sure everybody should be able to quote it, of considerable size or, size or extent, larger than other items of the same kind, of considerable, considerable importance or seriousness. It also means generous. And then we went to B, which is exploring our big God. And that's what we've been on. God's bigness uh, can be revealed in three major places. In his person, his presence, and in his power. We started out by looking at in his person. Under that, we looked at his individuality, his looks, his character, or his nature. And we looked at five character traits of God. Not to say that that is all or that this is exhaustive. We looked at God being big with respect to his love, his grace, his mercy. And if you were here last week, you know that we studied his understanding and what? His goodness. Praise the Lord. So today, remember I said, uh, in under exploring the bigness of our God, God is big in respect to his person, and number two, his presence. So that's what we're going to start looking at today. So all what I said was under A, his person. Now, his presence. If God is big, and indeed he's big, not only would his personality or his character show it, his presence is going to be revealed, uh, his presence will reveal and show to us that we're dealing with a big God here. Okay, so when we say the presence of God, what do we mean? Let's start with some definitions. Presence means the state or fact 
of existing, occurring, or being present. The state or fact of existing, occurring, or being present. It means the immediate proximity of someone or something. Notice that. The immediate proximity of someone or something. So when you say somebody is present, you mean that they are within the immediate proximity. Okay? It also means an invisible spiritual being felt to be nearby. An invisible spiritual being felt to be nearby. The impression that something is present. Am I too fast? Am I too fast? The state or fact of existing, occurring, or being present. Next, the immediate proximity of someone or something. Do we have that? An invisible spiritual being felt to be nearby. Are we good? Okay, next. The impression that something is present. The impression that something is present. The act of being present. The act of being present. So those are several definitions for the word presence. And as we proceed, they'll come in handy. Now, synonyms for the word presence, so that we're on the same page when we're talking about God's presence. Synonyms for presence include hereness. That is here, plus ness. Hereness. Immanence. Uh, like ima. Not e imao. I ima and nens, let me spell it, I-double-M-A-N-E-N-C-E, immanence, and immanence actually means remaining within, okay, these are dictionary definitions, words, hereness, immanence, immanency, inherence, inherency, Immanence, immanency, inherence, inherency. Occurrence. There's no occurrency. You feel grammar there. <laughs> occurrence. Omnipresence. Omnipresence. Shadow. Venus. Venus, just like here. There, Venus, okay? Ubeiti, Ubeiti, U B I E T Y, U B I E T Y, Ubiquitousness, or Ubiquitous, I think it's pronounced Ubiquitous, U B I Q U I. T O U S N E double S. Ubiquitousness and ubiquity. Ubiquity. These are synonyms. Amen. Amen. Okay. Of course, the antonym for, pr for presence is what? Absence. Simple. Okay. So we're going, we're looking at God being big. See after me, God is big in me. Remember, we are still exploring how big God is. Because the only way God can be big in you is when you establish that first of all, this God is big. Someone small cannot be big in you. Alright, so we've seen that God is big with respect to his person. Now we are looking at his presence. And what we are going to show today and next week, I'm, uh, I think at least at next week, is going to establish into our hearts that God's presence is very big. Amen. Therefore, we can expect him to be big in us. Jeremiah 23, 22, 23 to 24 and 2 Chronicles 6 verse 18. Jeremiah 23, 23 to 24 
2 Chronicles 6.18. Jeremiah 23.23. Am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not feel heaven and earth, says the Lord? Do you see that? Can anyone hide himself from me so I shall not see him? Do I not feel heaven and earth? Think about that. Do I not, God is saying, do I not feel? What does that tell you? That God feels heaven. And when we're speaking about heaven, bear in mind that the heavens and the earth put together refer to the universe, to the whole of existence. God says, I feel heaven and earth with myself. Think about that. Let that soak in. I, Jehovah God, feel heaven and earth. Are we talking about a small God? Even if God's, God's size and God's uh, uh, magnitude is only as big as the heavens and the earth, then we are talking about a very, 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 an extremely big God. Can I have a witness on that? But you see, the thing is not that God fills the heaven and the earth and then, you know, he fits it perfectly. No. God is bigger than everything he created. I want to say that again. God is bigger than anything he created. So if God fills the heavens and the earth and he made the heavens and the earth, he, God and the whole of the universe cannot be of the same size. Can I have an amen? So we're speaking about a very big God here. Second Chronicles 6 and 18. I love this verse. This is Solomon at the dedication of the temple, praying, speaking to Jehovah God. But will God indeed dwell with men on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built. Look at that. Heaven and the heaven of heavens. So this shows us that there is more than one heaven. At least from the Bible we can see. Paul talked about the third heaven. So when we talk about heaven, we are not just talking about the heaven, the throne of God. Solomon said, heaven and the heaven of what? Heavens. You know the verse that says, the heaven, e heaven, even the heavens belongs to the Lord, but the earth he has given to the children of men. It is in these heavens that we are told that there are multiplied millions of galaxies. It's in these heavens, we, you know, the heaven above us is the atmospheric heaven. Then above that layer of heaven, you have the planetary heavens. Astrologers and scientists and physicists tell us that the universe keeps on expanding. Have you heard that before? Now, people who don't know God say, say things like, it's the big, big bang theory. But we know from the word of God that the moment God said, let be, let there be, you see, that word is still in operation till today. And we are told that the universe keeps on expanding. I did a little bit of study to see how, what is the size of the universe. I saw something like, whatever that means, I don't know. 9.8 billion light years. I don't understand what that means. I'm going to research that after now. But it's, if you read other people, they even multiply it by 10. And the truth is this, if you check the dimension of the earth today, you check it 10 years, it's going to be different. Because it seems as if galaxies are still being born per minute per second. Are you following me, church? Remember that these heavenly galaxies that we are talking about, most of them are bigger in size than this earth. That's what we are told. Just think of the mere thought of it brings holy, holy shivers down your spine. That we are dealing, and God, the verse says there, that the heavens and the heavens of heavens cannot contain God. That means it's almost like God feels everything, and then, excuse me, for a lack of better term, what does he do? He spills over. He splashes over. So there is no place God isn't. Glory to God. There is, we are to, 
we are talking about a God whose presence, the magnitude of his presence is awesome. You see, you are here in this church today. Greenville is like a village on its own. It's very big. Do you know that you can be on one part of Greenville, for you to get to the other part of Greenville, it can take you, depending on how you walk, do you know it can take you 10 minutes? If you are at the gate and someone is waiting for you at the gate or that corner of the gate and you are at the far extreme side of the office, even if you walk fast, you see you're on Greenville. Where are you? I'm on Greenville. But you do not feel Greenville with yourself. Are you following me? You're on Greenville, but you are even in Greenville. If, let's say, why are we talking about Greenville? This tent, Seth, you are seated where you are, but what you can do is limited. I'm not talking about a God whose presence fills Greenville. I'm not talking about a God whose presence fills Port Harcourt, whose presence fills Nigeria. God whose presence fills the entirety of existence. And existence is not enough. Think about it. Existence, materiality, uh, 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 the universe as we know it has no precise prescribed definition. Sorry, dimension. It keeps on increasing. Yet Solomon said by the spirit that even this universe that keeps on increasing cannot contain God. So how big is God in his presence? Awesome. Great. And mighty God is he. Hallelujah. So write this statement down before I get ahead of myself. God feels everywhere with himself. Yet creation or the universe cannot contain him. Like I said, he's bigger than everything he created. God feels everywhere with himself. Yet creation cannot contain him. The universe. Write this down. God's center is everywhere and his circumference is where? It's nowhere. We've heard that a lot in church. God's center. Or like somebody expanded, God by his spirit. You know? His center is everywhere and his what? Circumference is nowhere. When you, refer, when you say center, you refer to the core of a thing. Is that correct? Now if somebody says his center is everywhere, that means he's present in that location. Are you following me? The, core, the word center comes from the word core. And that, that word core is even where we get the Greek word heart, cardia, the core. Your heart is the core of your being. You speak about the core of the tree, the heart. So when you say uh, God is in, his center is everywhere, that means every location God is present. But now notice this, his circumference is nowhere. What is his circumference? What's another word for circumference? Border. Thank you. Boundary. Perimeter. So what is this saying? It's saying that in every place, God is there. Are you following? But you cannot put an end to where God is. His center is everywhere. His circumference is nowhere. What is, in science, what is an atom called? I believe atom is the small, uh, smallest particle of uh, I see Brother Dave blowing uh, science for us now. The smallest particle uh, I wrote it down in my note. Let me see. <laughs> we have our area of grace. Uh, but uh, <laughs> what's pastor saying? <laughs> pastor, are you yabbing me? <laughs> huh? No, 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 no. Uh, this is not law now. <laughs> Okay, I can't even find it in the Lord. Maybe the Lord has blinded my eyes. <laughs> but we are told it's the smallest uh, indivisible uh, whatever. But it is that. Let me explain what I know. It's what holds a thing together. Now, that is what science tells us that. But what is that thing behind that atom? What is it? You see, when science doesn't understand some things, they just speak plenty. They, they, at the end of the day, they confuse themselves. But this is what I read in my Bible. The Bible makes us know that Jesus Christ is before all things. And in him, all things consist. That word consist means to hold together. That means everything in nature. Paul puts it this way in Hebrews. He upholds all things by what? The word of his power. 
That means in the minutest thing, God is there. Amen. This is the God that we are speaking about. So his presence, his center is everywhere. His circumference is nowhere. Write this down. His presence has no measurements. You can't measure. How do you measure? How do you put a measurement on God? And if we are saying that God's presence has no measurements, his center is everywhere, his uh, circumference is nowhere, that tells me that God is not limited. I said God is not limited. Praise the Lord. Now, the text we read before us now, these two texts, uh, Jeremiah 23, 23 to 24, and 2 Chronicles 6, 18, are going to form the basis of our study as we're exploring uh, the presence of God. And looking at those verses closely, there are two things we want to bring out. The first one, write this down, is the omnipresence of God. The omnipresence of God. And that's what I've been alluding to already strongly. The omnipresence of God. Remember that one of the definitions for presence is what? Omnipresence. And another word that goes with omnipresence is ubiquity. Being at the same place at, at different places at the same time. So the omnipresence of God. And number two, the personal or manifested presence of God. The personal or manifested presence of God. So when you speak about <clears throat> the presence of God, you could mean several things. One of the things you could mean is the omnipresence of God. God is everywhere. His center is everywhere. His circumference is nowhere. But also in speaking about the presence of God, we may be referring to the personal or manifested presence of God. Both of them are important for us to know and we'll take them one after the other. So let's write, let's study now the omnipresence of God. Look at that verse again, Jeremiah 23, 23 to 24. So the omnipresence of God, remember, refers to God being everywhere at the same time. Okay? The omnipresence of God. Jeremiah 23, 23. Look at this. Am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? the Lord. So this verse speaks to us about the omnipresence of God. Uh, Second Chronicles 6 speaks more about the manifested presence of God. But we're going to start with uh, Jeremiah 23, uh, uh, the text there. So Jeremiah speaks here about the omnipresence of God. Like I've said, omnipresence means being at different places at the same time. So write this down. God through his spirit is everywhere at the same time. God is everywhere at the same time. Everywhere at the same time. God is a spirit. Amen. I said amen. amen. God is a spirit. Now if you're born again, you are a spirit. You are not a body. You are a spirit. But here's the thing. Even though you are a spirit, your spirit is housed in your body. Is that true? You're born again. You're in the class of God. But you see, one of the features of God, for a lack of a better term, one of the characteristics of God, you know, in addition to the things we have shared, pastor shared, we shared, you know, uh, 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 mercy, grace, love, understanding. God has other char characteristics. Justice, uh, justice, uh, faith, righteousness, integrity, and all these things. These are the characteristics of God. You see, God has shared that with us. Amen. But you see, and, uh, some other characteristics uh, characteristic of God include uh, the fact that God is omnipresent. Another one is God is omnipotent. Another God one is that God is omniscient, or like some people say, omniscient. Okay? So God is omnipotent, all-powerful. God is omniscient, all-knowing. God is omnipresent everywhere at the same time. So God is a spirit. 
You are a spirit, but your spirit is housed in your body, and therefore it puts limitations on you. But the kind of spirit God is, remember we studied some weeks ago that God has some kind of form. Amen. So God has some kind of form. Whatever that form is, we will never know on this side of eternity. But what we know about God is that by his spirit, he's everywhere at the same time. That's why Jeremiah said, am I a God near and not also not a God far? So God is everywhere at the same time. Can you begin to see? Just think about it. Close your eyes and say to yourself, my father is everywhere at the same time. My father is everywhere at the same time. My father is everywhere at the same time. You can't say that when, before you say it up to 10 times, the greatness and the grandeur of God will begin to dawn upon you. Everywhere at the same time. So look, look at this. Let's write some things down based on what uh, Jeremiah said here. Some truths about the omnipresence of God. Write this down. There is no distance with God. There is no distance with God. Look at our text again, Jeremiah 23, verse 23. Am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God far off? When you hear the word near and far, what comes to your mind? What comes to your mind? Distance. So what God is saying, these are rhetorical questions. So God is saying, I am a God who is near, amen, and I am also a God who is what? Far. Now you see, near or far are dimensions. They refer to distance. God created, there are things God created for us, but God is not bound by them. For instance, God created time. But how many of you realize that God is not bound by time? In fact, with God, there is no time. God can tell you something that's going to happen 10 years from now, and the way God is speaking about it and emphasizing it is as though it's going to happen when? Now. In fact, it's almost as if it has happened. Because think about a God. You know, people think that God is old. God does not have age. I'll say that again. God is ageless. You see, our natural minds cannot appreciate that. Oh, you know, some of us here, he's the ancient of days. So when we hear ancient of days, what do we expect? His, his face is wrinkled and a long... How many of you watched Shaolin Master? <laughs> All those Chinese men have long beard come like this. You know, there's this school behind us. Uh, you know, a pastor has talked about this school before. You know, sometime in the morning, they'll be singing songs. Jehovah, you are the most high. But later on, maybe during Children's Day or some of end of year, I like the way you move me. Bash, 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 bash. Small, small children will be dancing orishi, orishi, jaku, jaku dance. But some days ago, they were worshipping early in the morning. So I was in my office and I was hearing their song. And they sang a song. Some of you may have sung that song before. Oh, mini science God. As old as you are, there is no one like, something like that. How many of you know that song? How many of you know it? So yeah, sing it now. As old as you are, you will never, hey, daddy mo, a shant of days. As old as daddy. Everybody say Babas. Babas. Say Babas. Babas. As old. God is not old. Amen. He's not. He, God is not old. God, how, okay, how old is he? God, sorry. He's not old. What we read is that he said, I am the Lord, I do not change. The prophet said in the Psalms, you are the same and your years will never fail. God has no age. So when are you going to start counting it? God lives in an eternal now. I like something Pastor said some years ago. God created time and he stepped out of time. And when Jesus was coming, he plugged himself in the person of Jesus back into time in a physical body. But Jesus Christ now has stepped out 
of time now. He's the glorified one so that he can regulate time. If God is subject to time, he can't regulate it. Glory to God. That's his presence. So he so don't sing those unscriptural songs. He sounds so pious. As old as you. Old woe. It's not old. And when we get to heaven, church, we are not going to be old. The Bible talks about, G, talks about, you see, okay, I mean, okay, let's go on. Praise the Lord. So we say here, there is no distance with God. Write this down. There is nothing beyond his range and his reach. Because there's no distance with him. He's present. Something far and something near are the same to him. Somebody, someone who fills the whole of the heaven and earth. Amen. There's no distance with him. Nothing is far. We use far. We use short for our own language. But with God, everything is naked and wide open. Write this down. God is not short-sighted. God cannot, it's not that God can see the things that are far. When somebody is short-sighted, that means they can see things which are close, right? God is not long-sighted either. When somebody is long-sighted, they can see things which are far, but they can't see things that are close. So if they want watching the TV or they want to read a book or something, they have to put on their spectacles. That is not God. God is not subject to that because all things are made bare. They are the same before him. Amen. So God has a perfect view of all things. Now, let's get practical a bit. Knowing this, that there is no distance with God, when you pray, you can, be, you can rest assured that your prayers are heard and answered. Does anybody see that? Knowing that there is no distance with God. If God needs to move something, look at this. If God needs to move something from Lagos to Port Harcourt, it's nothing with him. I said it's nothing. Because 100 kilometers or 300 kilometers, all of those things do not exist with God. Sometimes you want to order something because the way Port Harcourt is sometimes, some of the things that you think you'll find here, you can't find them. So you have to go, where will it be? Of course, it will be likely going to be in Lagos. So you order it from Lagos, but it becomes a challenge when you order it. You've bought it today, but the courier company is going to take two days. You can't hasten them. You found it, but there's still a challenge of time and distance. God has none of that, those. And when you pray to God in the name of Jesus, if something is in Cairo, if God needs to orchestrate it, it doesn't make any difference from God if, this, if God is pastor now and, you know, uh, 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 barrister is closest. It makes no difference to God as though if what God needs to move from Cairo is at the end of the church. There is absolutely no difference with God. There is no time, there is no space in the realm of the Spirit. Amen. There is no time. There is no space in the realm of the spirit. And when by your faith, listen to this church, when by your faith you lay hold on God, everything God needs to do to turn things around, he can do it. Because God is present there. Amen. If you have a tender in London, you don't need to be there physically. Who, can I, who do I know that can go for me? Who, who, who is my connection? God is there. Get that. He's omnipresent. He's there and it makes no difference as though he was here. You see, we should be careful not to arrogate the weaknesses of our human relationships to God. Oh, if my mother was here, mommy is in Lagos, she can't help me. If only she was here. So sometimes you think about God and you think the thing that you want God to do is in, is in a far place. So God cannot get there. There is no distance with God. Can you say amen? No distance in the realm of the spirit. Write this down. God can get to places where you can't get to. Because he's omnipresent. Did you get that? Because God is omnipresent, he can get to places that you cannot get to. So we said here that there is no distance with God. Number two, no one can hide from him. 
Again, looking at Jeremiah 23, right there. Look at verse 24 now. First thing, there is no distance with God. Because God is omnipresent everywhere at the same time, there is no distance with him. Number two, because God is omnipresent, no one can hide from him. Look at verse 24. God says, can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Can, anybody, can anyone hide from the Lord? Can anyone, now I'm asking you, can anyone hide from God? Of course, everybody will say no. But do you know the way we behave? Sometimes we behave as if we, uh, God doesn't know some things. How many of you will agree with that? Yes, in our behavior sometimes. And somebody who ran away from the presence of God is Jonah. He fled from the presence of God. Let's read about it. Look with me at Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Jonah chapter 1. Jonah found out that even though you run away from God, you can't hide from him. Amen. The best you can do is to run. Somebody who sees the whole, the whole earth. In fact, like we read when we started the series, that all the inhabitants of the earth, how does he say it again in that verse in Jeremiah? It's like a drop in a bucket. Drop. How can that God, how can you run away from that God? Please tell me. Everybody's like a drop in a bucket. Look at what Jonah found out. Jonah chapter 1. Are you in Jonah? Verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from where, please? Where, did, where was John, Jonah running from? From the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish. From where, please? The presence of the Lord. Look at that. Jonah fled from the presence of the Lord. Now, is it really possible to flee from the presence of the Lord? So this is at best an attempt to flee from the presence of the Lord. Why did Jonah run away from God's presence? Or what he thought was God's presence? Where was Jonah? Jonah was in Israel when the word, the word of the Lord came to him. So the Jews believed that the presence of God was in Jerusalem, was in Israel. So that was his thinking. Now it is true that the Shekinah glory of God, the manifested presence of God, shut up in the Holy of Holies, was in Israel. And so it was right for him to think that the presence of God was in Israel. But Jonah forgot, or maybe he didn't know, that God's presence is every, his center is everywhere, and his circumference is nowhere. He made that mistake. Why did Jonah run away? If you read chapter 4, Jonah knew that God was a God of mercy and grace. God told Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh and preach, cry against it because of its wickedness. But God wanted to give them a chance. But Jonah was a kind of vindictive preacher because he knew that if these people heard the message of God's love, what was going to happen? They would turn. Can you think about that? Instead of a prophet being happy that people will come to the Lord, he said, and Jonah said in chapter 4 there, he said, God, I know that you are merciful, you are long-suffering. That was why I took off. This is serious. But here's the thing. Jonah now said, I am going to flee from the presence of God. So what did he do? He took a, like today, would say he took a flight. And he had a stopover at Joppa. And then he went to Tarshish, thinking that God would not reach him there. But he found out, look at, think about it. Flee, presence of God. That's an oxymoron. That simply means it's a contradiction. How can you flee from the presence of God? You can't. Why? His presence is everywhere. His circumference is nowhere. God saw him. And Jonah went to Joppa. But the exciting thing about it is this. Even when Jonah was in his mess, listen to this church. When he was in his mess, he was in the boat. The boat was, uh, the waves were crashing on the boat. Eventually, Jonah told them to throw him into the sea. Is that correct? They threw him into the sea. But God, whose presence is everywhere, whose center is everywhere, whose circumference is nowhere, even in Jonah's 
rebellion and disobedience. Look at this. God orchestrated a whale, what I want to call a whale of mercy, to swallow Jonah up. Did you get that, church? What does that tell me? It doesn't matter where, how far you run away from God, God can still reach you. Amen. Now, it's not good to run away from God. Don't misunderstand me. But if you say you're running, how many of you, before you got saved, you know you ran from God? Can I have a witness? No, no, no. All of you are doing as if you are Jesus. You came from heaven above to show the way. How many of you, are, you ran from God? Oh, come on. God will forgive the rest of you who are lying. You ran away, but did God still apprehend you? He still, he still did. That's God's presence. That's God's presence. He's everywhere. Look at what David said about God's presence. Psalm 139. David otherwise, David knew otherwise. Look at Psalm 139 verse 7. David spoke about this same thing. Psalm 139 and verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? What does that tell you? God's presence is his spirit. Where can I go from your presence? Or where can I flee from your, your, from your spirit? Sorry, go from your spirit. Or where can I flee from your presence? If Jonah had read the words of David, he wouldn't have done what he did. Verse 8. Now look at this. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. Now look at verse 9. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, who does that sound like? Jonah. Dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. What did he say, verse 10? Even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say surely the darkness shall follow me, even the night shall be light about me. So you see, the presence of God you can't run away from it. I'm talking about his omnipresence now. His omnipresence. The fact that God is everywhere at the same time. So number one, there is no distance with God. Number two, you can't hide from God. Number three, there are no secret places with God. There are no what? Secret places with God. Look again at that verse. Jeremiah 23, look at verse 24. He says, can anyone hide himself, look at this, in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord. So God is saying nobody can hide himself. In other words, again, if you tell God, secret place, God, I have a secret place that you do not know of. How can you say that to God? Now look at this. God has secrets. Does God have secrets? Yes, he does. Uh, uh, Deuteronomy 29, 29 says that the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things revealed belong to us and our children that we may do according to the words of this law. God has secrets, but man has no secret from God. Do you get that? God has secrets. There are some things God has kept from man, and there are some things God has kept for his children. Those are secrets. There are some things as children of God, God has not hidden from us. He has hidden them for us. Can you say amen? amen? There are some things about the world, about the universe, about the existence that God has hidden away from man. There are some things that you wonder, God, why don't you let us know? Have you read, I mean, you read the Bible sometimes and you ask, okay, how many, uh, how many years did this happen? Why did this happen? The Bible doesn't address it. God has some of those answers, but they are not your concern. Amen. So he doesn't tell you. But man cannot have secrets against God. Uh, uh, cannot keep secrets from God. Let me give you the meaning of that word secret places and bring out some things there. The word secret means, if you're writing secret places, means a concealer or covert. Concealer or covert. It refers to a place of ambush. A place of ambush. A place of ambush. Do you have that? It indicates a strategic, secret, or well camouflaged location. A strategic, secret, or well camouflaged location. It also refers to, or rather, it is used of hidden places 
where royal wealth is stored. Where royal wealth is stored. Let me pick up on two of these definitions we gave. A place of what? Ambush. A place of ambush. That's what a secret place is. So we're saying that because of God's omnipresence, what does that mean? There are no secrets with him. There is no secret place with God. Now, the Bible makes us know that men have secrets from God. The Bible makes us know that men plan secrets. You know what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6? It says, take on the whole armor of God that you may be able to do what? Stand against the wiles. That word wiles means plans, plots, trickery, strategy. Look at what the Bible says in Psalm. Let me show you this verse. Psalm 65, sorry, 64 verse, verse 4 to 7. <clears throat> because of time, I'll just read it. Psalm 64 verse 4. So we're talking about a place of ambush. Look at verse 4. That they may shoot in secret. Say secret. At the blameless. It says suddenly they shoot at him and do not fear. That word secret is that same word secret place that we refer to. Verse 5, they encourage themselves in an evil matter. They talk of laying snares secretly. They say, who will see them? They devise iniquities. We have perfected a shrewd scheme, but the, both the inward thought and the heart of them is deep. Now look at verse 7. But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly they shall be wounded. What is this showing you? It is showing you that the evil people, the wicked people have plots. Is that correct? They have schemes. When they are planning these schemes, they think nobody knows. Amen. They have their plots. They've laid out things and they think nobody knows. But we have already seen because God is everywhere at the same time. Does God see it? God sees it. He knows it. God knows it. And when they are making their plots, when they are laying their traps, suddenly, you see, it tells us in verse 4 that these wicked people put their plots to action suddenly. But I like it because God has another suddenly. I said God has another suddenly. And when you follow God, God will lead you, God will guide you, and because God is everywhere at the same time, he's big in his presence, you will not fall into any plan or any plot that the enemy has laid before you. You don't even need to bother yourself praying, God, destroy any plot from me. You just follow the spirit of God who is everywhere at the same time time and is on your inside as a child of God and God will circumnavigate you through the issues and you'll come out on the other side of victory with songs of rejoicing on your lips. Glory to God. A good example is in 2 Kings chapter 6 when the king of uh, Syria was plotting against the king of Israel and they were having plots. The Bible tells us that every time he made a plan, the plan would fall. The plan would fall. So after so many times, he called his cabinet members. He said, guys, we have a mole among us. There's somebody, there's somebody who is ratting. Somebody is talking to the king of Israel. Guys, are you not going to tell me who is the traitor here? And one of his officials said, Ogasa, O king, live forever. Eh? Nobody here is, your, is a traitor. But look at this. He said, Elisha, the prophet, oh, glory to God, he tells the king of Israel, what you are speaking in your bed chamber. Think about that. Let me ask you, if a king is going to make a major military plot, is he even all of his cabinet members are going to know? No, talk to me. Do you plan for a secret operation openly? You know, when the president of the United States took over the new president, I heard that there is this code that only, uh, is it nuclear code, that only the president knows. Only him. Only the president. So there are some mega secrets that, you know, the closer you get into the inner sanctorium, they are the only people who know it. But look at this. The Bible doesn't say that Elisha told what the uh, king was saying within his cabinet. Where does he say? In his bed chamber. God was reading his mail. Now, your bed chamber is a place of privacy and intimacy. It either means the king discussed it with his wife. I don't believe he discussed it with his wife. What it means was that his secret advisors came to meet him in his chamber 
and say, Augusta, how are we going to do this? Okay, show me the map. Let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. As he was thinking the plan, as they, in fact, before they commented the plan, before they revealed it, Elisha, in his own corner, they had already known. He said, uh, King of Israel, come, 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 come. Eh? This is the place. He told them where the enemy, oh, glory to God. He told them this is the place the enemy is going to have come. And the Bible says he saved him not once, not twice. That means a minimum of three times. What does that tell you? The gift of the Spirit was in operation. God already knew their plan because, listen, even before they prepared that plan, God was already there. God already knew what was going to happen. And listen to me, church, because God is omnipresent, write this down, his presence implies his knowledge. Because God is present, he knows. He doesn't need to be present to know, but because he's present, guess what? He knows. So when the king was there plotting in his room against, <laughs> against Israel, God already knew and God revealed it. Listen to me, church. The Bible says that there is no counsel, there is no device, there is no understanding that is planned against the Lord. I'll say that again. That is in Proverbs chapter 20, uh, Proverbs 21 verse 30. There is no wisdom, there is no counsel, there is no understanding against the Lord. Anybody who plots against you, listen to me church, is plotting against the Lord. God takes it personally. God's presence is there. And God, all you need, you don't need to say, God, show me what is the enemy planning. No, God is big in his presence. I said God is big in his presence. And God will reveal, all you need to do is to follow God. And you see, church, the gifts of the Spirit belong to us. Because remember, omnipresence implies knowledge. And how, you see, God knows so much. But here's the thing with God. God will begin to reveal his secrets unto you. He will tell you, if God could do this to an Old Testament king, when they didn't have the Spirit of God within them, the gifts of the Spirit are available to you. And God will reveal to you what you need to know because his presence implies his knowledge. And God is big in his presence. Can you say amen? amen. He's omnipresent. Say it after me. He's omnipresent. He's, omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's everywhere. At, the At the same time. He's omnipresent. He's omnipresent. Therefore, Therefore, there is no distance with him. Therefore. Nothing is far. Nothing is near to him. All things are the same before him. Because he's omnipresent, there is nothing that can be hidden against him. Nothing that can be hidden from him. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and thank him for his word. Blessed be his name. Blessed be his holy name. Say it after me. God is big in me. God is big in me. He's big in his presence. He's everywhere at the same time. His center is everywhere. His circumference is nowhere. Give him praise and give him glory. Give him praise. Give him glory. That's your God. That's your Father. That's your God. That's your Father. Big in his presence. Big in his presence. Meditate upon that. The whole of existence cannot contain him. That's your God. That's your Father. It can't contain him. And he is your father. And he lives within you. Father, we give you praise. We give you glory. We give you praise. We give you glory. For your awesome majesty. For the bigness, the awesomeness of your presence. You alone are God because you are the only one who is omnipresent. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you praise. We give you glory. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Every head bowed. Every eye closed. All heads bowed. All eyes closed. No one looking around this moment. You're in church. You're not born again. You do not know Jesus as Savior and Lord. Or you're watching online. Or you watch later, I mean, uh, after this broadcast. You don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord, but you'd like to do that. Can I see your hand up? While all heads are bowed, all eyes are closed. I'll pray with you. I'll pray for you. Ushers, please help me. Is there anybody who wants to accept Jesus as their Savior and as their Lord? while all heads are bowed and every eye is closed. If you're watching online, just say these words after me. Say, Father God, I come to you today in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. You raised him from the dead for my righteousness. Jesus, save me now. I make you my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Father, for saving me. 
I'm now born again and I'm your child in Jesus name father I pray for as many people as may have paid that prayed that prayer I ask that they'll not only prosper they'll also flourish in Jesus name amen amen